Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Matthias Valentin. I've been involved in the Bro project in, since 2006. I've started working on the Bro cluster as part of my bachelor thesis. This is where we introduced the whole idea of clustering and um, it was quite insightful when we went through this process because we found out, hey, we, can, we would like to synchronize the nodes, but it should be cheap and we don't want to send a whole lot of information around. And then we found, we added some feature that is barely used anymore. And I just want to introduce it just as a historical anecdote real quick. It's, it's the mergeable attribute that we, that we introduced. And it means that when we have a set, two sets and two different nodes, and you add one entry on one node, it automatically should propagate to the other node, such that only um, the addition is being propagated to the other node and that they automatically end up the same. So this is how I got involved in the Bro project. It was quite exciting. And now I've been uh, developing the, on, on Bro and working with Bro since. And um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools that we're going to use for processing Bro logs. And tomorrow, we're going, going to t tell you a bit about more advanced exercises. So that's, it's quite important to understand your toolbox. And for the Bro logs, for the basic Bro logs, this is just Unix tools. Many of, them are, many of you are probably familiar with, with them, but I just want to highlight a few key features. That, and with those five tools, and the new kit on the block here is, is Bro Cut, that you will be able to do almost all of your incident response quickly, summarize, aggregate data, the way you shape it, reshape it the way you want it to be. And um, it's important to introduce that to you because you will do that over the course of the workshop and it saves significant time for prototyping. Usually in incident response, you don't start with writing a bro script because you know what's going on. You just start poking through logs and find something and then it shapes up into a pattern and, and then all of a sudden you found something that is a more general thing and you can eventually then write the bro script. But all the process starts with digging through the logs and that process should be efficient to save costly analyst time. So these are the tools. We start with awk. Many of you have heard that. It's the Swiss Army knife for log processing. And in its general form, it reads a line from, from the standard input and then applies, uh, applies whatever you give it on the command line. And the general form of an awk program is a pattern and then in curly braces, an action. Um, this is just terminology. You might use awk already without even knowing that. Um, there are a few examples that I want to go through. That, that, that this is a pattern, for example. You can omit the entire stuff in the curly braces. So you can just filter. If you just specify a pattern, in, that will filter log files. And here, it's a regular expression you filter from start to stop. This, uh, this is one way of filtering. Another way of expressing a pattern is uh, you only output lines whose length is greater than 72 characters. And $0 is here the variable for the entire line. By default, awk chops up the input line according to the input separator. And it's a that is also a tab. So if you would apply awk directly to bro logs, you can use $1, $2, for the corresponding columns in the bro log. This is one where, where we assume we have an IP address in the first column and some, some text in the second column. This is another filter of, of expressing, I would like to filter all local host addresses and where $2 matches, to, matches the string foo. That's a tilde, by the way. It didn't came really out well. That's the operator for re regular expression matching in awk. A slightly more elaborate example is, OK, I still want to filter on localhost. That's the pattern. And now I add an action. For each line, I use this variable x that awk, you can define it on the fly. Uh, and I add the value of the third column to it. And so for each line, it all crunches through the third column and sums up the value. When the program exits, you print the value. 
That's one way of implementing aggregation of logs. If you want to find, well, what's the total volume that this host has been sent in the last five minutes? That would be a classical way to, but where this pattern comes into play. And, and here's a yet a more complicated one where we use associative arrays or tables. Um, if you assume there's an address in the first in the first column, and and it's not only localhost, but we want to now do the same counting for on a per address basis. Here we can again implicitly use this associative array, and we index it with the address from the from the first column, and then add the value of the third column to it. So now now all of a sudden we don't have just filtered by this specific IP addresses. We have for all addresses that occur in our logs, we have created those counters. And why this is potentially a bad idea, we'll address at the end of the talk. Um, at the end of the program, you just iterate over the table that you have created here, x, for each i, for each element in x, uh, you print its value. And, and here, i is just a counter that is an index that that is representing the number of values from one to uh, the cardinality of that of that set, and you say x i it's, it's the index. So it's it's giving you for the counter for each address that you see. It might be actually more intelligent here to print out also the the corresponding IP address and not just the just the counter, but that's a separate thing. Um, Okay, this is a classical way of how you implement blacklists. You, you start with an associative array. There's an evil address that you put in and just increment a counter. That's the plus plus is the implicit increment. And awk figures out this is a count. And it then has that element in its set. And at, then you do this before you actually crawl all the log lines. That's why the begin statement is here. And then the action part is, if, if you see the first field, and we had that being an address here all the time, it's the same semantics again. If you see that in there, then invoke some function. Something's going on. You can also write custom functions. But then this is just a placeholder for whatever you want to do. Um, sometimes when, when I get asked, well, can you see if these IP addresses show up on your network? Then, OK, what, what do I do? I go through my bro logs. I write a script, quick script that generates this awk program that starts with all these IP addresses. And then I can process thousands of logs quickly. Because all that it does, this is, a t is again, this is a Seth mentioned that earlier with constant time. This is an insertion in a table. And a check can be done in constant time. The meaning this if check, if $1 is an x, is constant. And then, then it's just really blazingly fast to crawl through gigabytes of logs and check whether you, this address, for example, occurred in there. So that's just one way you could imagine of implementing blacklists and checking whether it occurs. Then awk is almost a full-blown language. Again, I don't want to tear away the focus from bro and <laughs> shift it to awk, but it's, this is what you do after bro. This is the stuff that happens um, beyond. And then there's functions like length, substring. Length, length give you the value of a string. Substring, you can extract uh, characters sub of, of a string. Match is a regular expression function. Split can divide up strings according to a, a specific separator that you give. For example, this string here, 6666, if you would <coughs> say split that string at the, co at the dot, you would get an array with four elements, and each being six. Bro has the exact same function, and it actually has more f flavors of the split function. And we will talk about those advanced functions later in this workshop. Substitute is to substitute values. Bro has that too. Two lower is uh, just, yeah, the name says it. It downcases the characters. And the two, uh, two variables that are global, globally accessible, it's the current number, the current row number, which is um, an R. And an F is the current, uh, the, the current, the number of fields in the current line. This is mostly not. It's not too important for Brolux because they all have the same amount of columns. But you might end up using it for 
other logs. Uh, any questions on ARC? We're going to heavily rely on this, uh, so it's 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 good. To, if you have any questions now, it's a good good time to ask about its quirks or. Uh, not yet, no. But we can make it available while of, during the workshop. Okay. Sometimes, often when you when you run one of those filter scripts, you just want to only have the first five lines or the last ten lines, and that's where two complementary tools come into play. It's just head and tail. They pretty much say what they are. They take one argument on the command line. It's the first n is the number of first lines, or n is the number of last lines respectively. Uh, more interesting is sort. Sort is uh, your intermediate tool that you'll use during aggregation. And it, uh, I put external in parentheses, it can sort externally. It can sort more data than you can fit in memory by relying on temporary files. Uh, it also does it, well, it does the grouping for you, and it also can filter duplicates. Some uh, important options that I would like you to remember, um, or maybe you can always look them up in the man page, by the way, on all, all the stuff that I also said earlier. It's just a subset, what I deem the most relevant stuff from the man page. N is numerical comparison. By default, sort uses string comparison, which might, for numbers, not always be ideal. There's a dashed R where you can just reverse the order of the result. Uh, usually it's uh, ascending, so the largest value is, is at the bottom. This used to be Unix history where you get a bunch of output and the highest value is at the bottom of the screen where you can still read it. And if you want to reverse that, for example, in combination with head, uh, then that's, that's the right switch to use. U does automatic, automated duplicate filtering when you have multiple lines that are the same. It just puts out one. And k is also an, an, a neat one. It, you can sort based on a specific column, meaning you don't have to cut off or chop off the first part of the text so that sort usually starts with the beginning of the line. You can just navigate directly into the column. I said, oh, I just want to filter now sort by port, for example. And um, you can also uh, specify where this should end. It's the start and the end, or from two, from column two to column three, that's what you could say. And then it takes the column two and column three. You can actually speci specify that switch multiple times on the command line, and then you first sort it by column two, and then secondly by column one. So dash, that would be dash k two comma two, or dash k one, in that, in that order. Um, if that's interesting if you have large amounts of data. Dash S gives you the buffer size of the external buffer. If you, that, in this case, if you specify dash S one gigabyte, means it takes one gigabyte of disk space if, uh, if it needs to accelerate the sort. And this quite drastically improves the speed of your pipe that you create when you, um, when you have large files, where you need going to the disk because it that the sort doesn't fit in memory. And another way to speed it up is by the dash T switch, where you can actually specify where this one gig file should be located. And if you have a super fast grade zero somewhere, <coughs> then you can just give, him, give explicitly the path to the file where sort stores its intermediate uh, files for, that are later merged. So here's an example. Um, goes through the connection log, takes the third value, which I think is this originator source address, um, sorts it, and prints only the unique values. That would be, gives you a snapshot of all the originators in Conlog. Another way would be to, OK, what was 9? Now, this is just operating on the raw logs. We will see later that the tool BroCut facilitates. You don't have to remember what 9 means, what $3 means. They have, that's something we've worked around with. But I think nine is the service field, if I'm not mistaken. Um, duration. The duration? Oh, yeah. OK, so that gives you then the 10 large, longest connections in your con log and just prints them the whole line. And ideally, when you have the 10 longest connections, you just add another pipe here and 
pre-filter the attributes that you want. But this is, this is just operating on bare logs right now, two examples where we combine awk and sort. Are there questions on it? OK. Unique, that's the, another ingredient when it comes to aggregation. Unique has um, three interesting command line switches. And, and the most important one is dash C, where you count. Essentially, it counts the number of unique lines. And then you can manipulate that. Uh, well, you can also use unique to only output the duplicate lines or only the unique lines. That's uh, sometimes useful. We'll use that um, later in, in the workshop. Here's an example input. If I have sorted already four A's, three B's, one C, and well, not surprisingly, unique dash C would prefix each occurrence with a count. Um, what would dash D give us? A's and B's? Right. And, and dash U is obvious. OK. Well, you, you got the concept. That's, uh, now, let's tie this one with our last tool in the toolbox, which is BroCut. That's, uh, that's amazingly helpful. Um, and we use it throughout all most mo major exercises now in the, in the workshop. It, uh, <laughs> The conlog fields, we just talked about them. They have a field separator. They have names and types, even. And why not specify the name of the field directly rather than in awk $9? And then two months later, the log, you'd have a custom change to your log format. And oh god, did I shuffle those around? Did I change the log? So the name makes this order independent of of your log, and it's an extractor for all bro logs. It gives you whatever fields you specify on the, on the command line. And, and here, dash D does, again, some, some, some a little bit more than that. It actually converts the epoch timestamps into human readable strings. And if you, if you go beyond that, you can say dash capital D and give it a specific format string, how you would like the time to be formatted. Um, that's, so this is, this is the new, this is the new kit on the block that we heavily rely on during the workshop. Here's an example. Uh, so you just want, from the cron log, you only want those three fields, timestamp, the originator IP, and the responder port. Then it's essentially, at what time did which internal host of yours connect to what, what port. And then you get to, to these lines are shrunken down to three columns. And here's it in a pipe. Say you want to extract the URL of an HTTP log. The URL by default is split across two fields, which is host and URI, so that you can easily manipulate it easily. But to get the full URL, it's quite a common task. Uh, now all you need is to specify host and URI on BroCut and pipe it to awk and print those two together. And uh, in, in fact, if you don't care about the space in between, you can just remove the awk part. This is illustrating the dash D flag. Uh, BroCut goes through all time fields. So remember that each field has a type associated. And each field of type time that is listed on the command line, BroCut goes through and represents it with the corresponding time stand. This one, you need to install gawk on your system. But once it's installed, BroCut uses it transparently. So it won't work if you have gawk not installed. So your, your package manager should probably provide a version of that. Here's a slightly more evolved example. Um, we specify a special format string. And in this case, it's, it's just doing the, <laughs> the re reverting back to normal, Unix timestamps. Except there's no microseconds. So or everything after the dot is scripted. I just want the plain seconds value. 
And then what I do, okay, bro, bro, one thing I haven't no, uh, really pointed out, bro cut takes lines on S in standard in. So I feed it standard lines I read from the files from conlog with this uh, input operator. You could also equally say cat conlog and pipe it to bro cut. It's the equivalent, just to saves a few characters on the command line. Um, again, so that's, that's what I do here. I extract the timestamp, the number of bytes sent by the originator in that connection, and the number of bytes sent by the responder. So in, in each bro log, bro maintains those counters separately for each direction. That's uh, how it works in TCP. So I, that's what I do. I read the con log. I sort the, sort the output. And that means, essentially, because the first value in, in my output is a timestamp, I sort it by time. And I will have a lot of values that have the same beginning timestamp. And then, essentially, for each, for each second of traffic, and depending on how much traffic you have per second, you end up with a bunch of lines in that output after sort. I mean, you can, you can try, play with it incrementally, and just re remove the last part of the pipe to see what the output looks like. I'm, I'm now walking through the entire pipe here. And, and what I'm doing then is, I do I write a little aggregation function. The idea is, at the end, to get the number of bytes that have been transferred per second. And, uh, if, and this, is one, this is just a representation of one second, and this is the number of bytes. So this second, I got 33,000. Here, 22,000. And for all, all, across all connections, that's what this little awk script does. And uh, let me just briefly walk through it. it, it if you check the timestamp, if the timestamp is, is the one that you have saved, TS, um, in the past, then you add both the number of originator bytes and the number of responder bytes to a variable called size that you, again, define here on the fly. If the timestamp is not in the first, is not the one that you have remembered in the past, then you've probably crossed from one second to the other. Remember, the output looks like a bunch of rows with the same value. And, and at some point, you go to the next second. And this is where this else branch hits. And if the size is not 0, then you probably want to print it out. And then what, what you do is you print out the second value plus the size. This is the second value, and this is the size in here. And then you assign the current, the new second value to this variable ts that is being checked here, and reset the size. Does that make sense, more or less? So, mm -hmm. so the way I understand this, is the separator being taken care of implicitly? Um, do, yeah, if, so if you specify a sep different separator, for example, there's a dash F flag in ARC that you can use to tell it the new separator, and then it takes care of it. But uh, throughout this pipe, by default, tab characters are assumed by all these tools, and uh, that's why it just works out of the box. Um, does that answer your question? OK, we'll just um, talk about a few caveats um, before we dive into the, some of the exercises. Um, we, which of these ones is the best way to look for an IP address? The last one? Yeah, OK. So why is the first one an, an issue? Yeah, well, yeah, we have this grep takes a regex as the first argument. And this is, these are caveats that you all run into, at least once. If, if, you, if nobody tells you that, that's, that's quite important. Because if you look for an IP address, and all of a sudden you get false positives, because the address has uh, another one here and another four at the end. Well, yeah, that's, that's why grep is dangerous by default if you just don't verify the output meticulously. 
And well, then you can say, well, we know, I, I know this. I take fgrep. fgrep takes all this stuff and looks just, does not interpret it as a regular expression, but interprets it as a string. So you just look for the string. Well, it turns out still the boundaries can have the same issue. So now you can have false positives of the form with 29 and 48 at the end. And really only the, if you want to be sure, just, just stick to it. Use arg for this kind of stuff, because then you won't make a mistake. Then, then your analysis, your result will be correct most of the time. And just you have to make sure that you check for both originator and responder, so $3 and $5 if you want to click for operate on the raw con log. Oh yeah, reference by this might be a bad idea. If you have IP addresses of a large network and keep counters, well, for the all IP addresses, say, you, you see everything, you see a random worm or something, uh, then this ends up containing, collecting up a lot, eating up a lot of memory. Um, it's different from the blacklist example that you specify at the beginning, it doesn't change, but here it changes at runtime and might explode. This is just one example, um, probably it will work in most of the cases just fine, but you just make sure you, when you do such things, there's, uh, there's another way of expressing the exact same thing with a different tool chain. So if you really want to count per originator, you can also just print the value and sort by it and, and let unique do the aggregation. The difference here is that sort and unique do this rely on external space, on disk space, if, if the output is getting large. OK, qu questions on that? So then let's uh, look a little bit about some exercises. Oh, yeah, there's some. Now you can go ahead and go into your network. And uh, yeah, there are a bunch of bro testers here. That, uh, <laughs> um, OK, let's see if we can make this. I hope you have all downloaded the 2009 trace. And now we can go through the exercises together and see where you get s stuck. And um, we are probably on the side. You can ask anybody, or you can also ask direct questions. Of, I'd, be, I'd be curious to know where issues arise. The first exercise is to uh, run bro on this large trace. It's probably a 500 megabyte trace, roughly, or 800 megabyte trace. And you get a bunch of logs. And in, in these logs now, that's the setting we operate. So when you've run bro on that, then the first exercise is to just list the connections in order of duration. Um, and uh, let me just go back to the relevant slide for that. Mm. This is sh just the warm up we go through. This is just a bunch of connection statistics that you might want to extract on the fly. And um, here we start with a simple filter. It's just a filtering stretch. Uh, it's just even reshuffling the order of rows in the output. And it would be, um, does anybody, well, OK, I think I'll just present a solution. Um, there's, if we operate on raw, bro logs, we skip the first four lines because they, we don't want to include them. And we do this by adding this filter number of rows greater than four. When we later on from other exercises, we use bro cut, we don't need that anymore because uh, bro cut chops those away implicitly. So we'll chop up the first four rows of con log and then pipe it to sort and sort by the duration field, which is number nine, and sort numerically. Uh, this is some, there's some redundancy. Sort has a weird way of specifying the tab character. You don't need it by default, but it's just I put it out once in there so that you know how to specify a separate, different separator. And for a tab character, it's this weird dollar notation with two quotes in there. So that, that will be the, the first exercise. It's, and it's just shuffling around the input, so when you get uh, meaning the result would still be the entire con log just ordered differently. And if we, if we look by, uh, by field nine here, we, uh, what, where is it? 
I think I went too far. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's ignored. The output you can also verify verify yourself. So now, um, if we want to extend that, okay, we want to extend the filter and find all connections that are longer, no longer than a what is it? Yeah, that last longer than a minute. We uh, does anybody have an idea of how to do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's really this is just warm up. It's it's really basic. Exactly. You just you specify the field number um, that we look in the con log, and if it's greater than sixty, we print the row, the entire connection. And otherwise, it's it's not going to show up in the output. <laughs> OK, now let's get more to networking stuff. So all these exercises are very generic. Tomorrow we'll talk about more incident response kind of like exercises that use the same tools. Now we want to find all IP addresses of web servers that sent more than one kilobyte back to the client. We usually start this way by identifying the relevant data, meaning web servers, how do we get those? We can answer this all from the con log, by the way. You don't need to go for this exercise in any other log file to find this. Send more than one kilobyte back to the client. OK, we had heard earlier there's a field that has responder bytes, which is what the responder sends back. And in the web setting, we always know that the res originator is the client and the responder is the server, because that's how HTTP operates. So we can take a look at the responder bytes field and apply the corresponding filter. And this is a specific, in, for those of you who, are, who, think, who think in SQL, find all IP addresses. This is essentially a select IP address. And for that, we have learned to use this new tool, bro, bro cut. And if you have done a make install or installed bro in your system, it should be available directly for you. With bro cut, you can readily use it. Are there any questions on this one? I'd be happy to know what's going on.
So just a quick note, if you're still experiencing problems, problems with NCSA wireless, just come see Adam during lunch and he'll, uh, he'll take care of you. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. <Seth. laughs> okay, let's look at the solution. It's, um, it involves three tools, BroCut, Arc, and Sort. We'll extract first the relevant data that we're interested in, web servers. Web servers, this is the service field that corresponds to the service field in the HTTP log. And the nice thing is if you, you just say web servers and look at the service field, and if it's HTTP, you know it's an HTTP connection. The alternative, maybe the old mindset you used to, well, I got to look for all HTTP ports, 80, 80, 80, 3, 1, 2. And no, Bro has dynamic protocol detection. It, when it finds a HTTP connection, regardless of what the port is, it labels it as HTTP in the service field. So that greatly facilitates identifying web servers in the first place. Um, so we look, there's a thing, a thing in the way. Yeah, oh. yeah there's, um, this is dollar one. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of this. No. Oh, it's the other one. Okay, yeah. If, if the service field is HTTP, that's the first filter. We only want to filter HTTP. And if the responder bytes 1K is what we specified here. I think there's um, three zeros too much. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, then uh, yeah. And if that's the second condition, more than one kilobyte, then we print that IP address. And here it's the, it's the web server address that we're interested in, and we specify by the ID responder host field. And, and now the, those fields, $1, $2, $3, <coughs> They only reference to the order that is specified in bro cut. So here it's service is dollar one, this is dollar two, and this is dollar three. So that really makes those dollar numbers. If you use bro cut in combination with arc local to your to your pipe, and in that sense, uh, much easier to read and also work across different con logs from your from your other fellow incident responders that have customized their logs in a way that contain more columns and. Maybe things shuffle around. And then what we do is, since we only interested all in all IP addresses, this one just prints out the number of, well, this, this one prints out the actual IP address, but there might be duplicates. So we just sort with the dash U flag, which means filter out the duplicates. Equivalently, we could have said sort and pipe it to unique again. Um, does that raise any question? Or is this pretty much clear? And the solutions will be up. They will be detailed examples, and they will also be fixed. <laughs> because they're yeah, that's, I think, the output you should get. Yeah. OK, the next exercise is a very it was a Boolean question. You might be interested if you operate a network. Do I have any web servers on non-standard ports? And for now, let's. Just use 80 and 80, 80 for the sake of the analysis. But it's something you might want to know if somebody <coughs> runs a web server on a non-standard port. And uh, that can be very succinctly summarized into a quick awk pattern in combination with bro cut. Yeah? I was just wondering if I did something wrong. I got a much longer list. Um, you got a much longer list? Yeah, OK. Let's, let's well, see. I, uh, that's right. I used one K versus one meg. That's what okay. Did. Yeah, there was there's an issue with the bytes. Sorry about that. So, uh. so in this case, I mean, you, you, I have to assure you, there's no web server on a non-standard port in this trace. It's more about how to formulate that question, and. Um, we again extract. Well, but here in this case, we had extract. The service, the, the responder port, which is the web server port, and the responder host, which is the web server IP address. And then we look for all the service fields. And in addition to that, we need another condition. And that condition is um, 
a non-standard port is either port 80 or port 8080. And we want the opposite, so we want not that. And that's why we chain it with the, to the service field by the end. If both conditions are met, then we have a web server on a non-standard port, and we print its corresponding IP address. And there's a sort dash u again to, to really only list those IP addresses that we're interested in. The questions on this one? So this is, this is just one exercise after the other is trying to uh, give, yeah, make you fam familiarize with, with the tools and inculcate some strategy, general strategy of how to process bro logs. Um, this is the last one I'm going to go through on this set of exercises, then we go in HTTP. This introduces a new concept, which is aggregation. And um, aggregation here, when I ever see a breakdown or histogram or ever something like that, that's some sort of aggregation. And you can think of, huh, I probably have to construct some sort of sort and unique pipe because I sort something, get an output, and then count it. And I, that's, that's, a, that's a classical, that's, a, aggregation is one of the key features also you, when you want to elevate lots of data into higher levels of abstraction to make them more accessible, readable, by time, and we go all through all these examples later in the workshop, but this is basic in the sense we would like to have a service breakdown. Each line is a number of connections, uh, each, each, uh, each line represents a single connection, and um, meaning we can treat the entire con log as the number of rows in it, as the number of total connections seen in this trace, and that's that's all we need here for this exercise. <coughs> okay, it's pretty straightforward. That's why I'm going to go over it quickly. All we need is the service field. The number of lines is implicitly telling us the number of connections. We're we sort it by service and count the number of unique um, services that we see, and then we sort it again to have just a nice output. And that will give us something along the lines of this. We have two FTP data connections, two FTP connections, two FTP data. Fortunately, that matches. Um, SMTP, SSL, well, DNS is the most part. So this is quickly how you can get a little histogram of what's going on in your network. Just write this short script out of a con log and can can see, well, I got this much of different services running. A question on that? You look skeptical? No? No, no. I, okay. So I, I'm, I'm watching all this with Broca. We rely real heavily on the CF function in, in 1.5. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of looking at this trying to how Oh, can you hit the uh, mic real quick? Thanks. There, is that? All right. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so we use CF a lot uh, in 1.5, and I'm kind of looking at this and, and churning through how we're going to replace that functionality with, yeah. with this bro cut. Um, and it's not skepticism, it's okay. preponder <laughs> you know, <Sure>. pondering. <laughs> yeah, let us know if you have any so, issues. And I, I guess I'm interested in. in you know, if, if you have any, how, have you been using this for long? How did, did you use CF extensively before and, and any tricks you have for sort of replacing that? Because we'd always pipe to, to CF to fix the clock because uh, that's always relevant yeah. uh, data to us. So any, anything you can speak I, to as far as okay. that would be helpful. Yeah, and this, I honestly have not used CF a lot. Okay. I um, I've done. I've used gawk for that for the time manipulation. Although CF should do the job, but uh, without talking too much about CF, I, the first time I noticed bro cut, I said, "Wow, that's I wanted this for so long," and now it eases the entire analysis process so much with the capital percent s. You can really emulate CF in a sense. You can just make it output whatever you want. Um, it's. I think it's bro cut is just a superset of it and. In the sense you have another way of extracting fields too, in addition to that. Yeah. Um, so is is there something you're missing from Brocut? Because 
going going from the understanding Robin wrote Bro Cut two weeks ago, <laughs> secret that that's incredibly new, and the idea was just that we don't want Bro Cut's going to get replaced. I, I mean, this is probably something Robin doesn't want me to tell, but Bro Cut's getting replaced. It was a temporary tool to get people out of the mindset of saying pull out column one, two, and three because. I promise you, if you do that, I will break your scripts in future releases, inevitably. So I wanted people to start referring to the column names, and this was just sort of a step that direction. Robin somehow wrote this script in an evening or something. Um, but uh, And then, then that time thing was even something I had, I had asked for, because like what you're running into, I always use CF, like just constantly. And um, is there something, is there anything missing from it? And the cool thing actually about it is that these logs are self-descriptive. So any column that has a time value in it, and the SSL log in particular, has the um, not valid before, not valid after. And it'll actually convert that into a, time, a readable timestamp too. So it's not, it's not limited to just that you know, first column like CF always did. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's different, but it, I think it's worthwhile. There, I think there's more stuff we need to add. We need to be able to just say, you know, all columns, and basically use it exactly like CF. Is yeah. that kind of what you are missing? One thing I would add. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. So you just do all. Uh, the one missing piece of the you cannot just keep all the fields and just replace the time. Yeah. It's, is, there's, really a, there's a ticket in the tracker exactly for that, because I was doing something on traffic, real traffic, I was looking through it, and I was like, wait a minute. I want to do it like CF, and they, you know, I mean, immediately. So we are thinking about that because I ran into the exact same issue. And now that I'm following through in my head, yes, I ran into that, and we have a ticket already. So. Two more pieces to that. One is I, I did write it in an evening just because I, just be, I did write it in an evening just because I claimed all the time how easy our log files now are to deal with. <laughs> so it's actually easy to do that in all. It's, it's just an all script. <laughs> um, and the second, uh, just a clarification. So um, we are going. Quite likely going to replace Procut with something else, but this kind of tool will always be there. So I imagine that we always have a, a, a script, something which is called Procut and which does this functionality. Just internally, I think, yeah. mm -hmm. have a, a kind of a library approach so that you actually do not use to have this. Do not you do not have to use this um, script, but you can also like interface it directly to Python, for example. So that in Python you have an abstract interface to Bro law. You can just iterate over that, for example. And, and the, the script representation of that will still exist. Yeah. So you will be able to yeah. do this sort of yeah. thing. So we always, you will always have this tool. So if, it's not that if you now start using this tool, uh, you need to be afraid that, I don't know, next week you won't have it anymore. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. So uh, technically, there would be lunch time right now. Um, if, you, if you're hungry, you may uh, just go for the lunch. Um, there are, if you want to stick with a few more exercises, the solutions are there. They're pretty self-explanatory. You um, can always ask me questions or approach me later if you want to run them offline. Um, yeah, so that said, we... Uh, I, I think I may have pointed this out earlier. I, I think because <coughs> this is all sort of last minute put together, I, I think we do have more exercises than you know anyone could really do. So. Uh, we are posting all the solutions and everything afterward, which in one way is annoying for us because for the next workshop we have to make new stuff. But um, that's, that's okay. Uh, so I, I think we're going to be posting the solutions. We, we're going to post the solutions online. Everything is going to be online, the material.